Well, thank you, Rob, for that. And, and I want to repeat, uh, reconfirm his thanks to all the groups that brought me here. And I especially want to thank you for coming to hear me. And it's nice uh, to see people under 50 here. No offense to my cohort. But the median age at my talks is about 50. The people who can remember Nixon are the ones who, you know. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> OK. Uh, I can't go into who Nixon was. That's a whole nother lecture. Um, but it, it, unnecessary, because, you know, Nixon lives. Um, yeah, it's very important that uh, we connect you know, we, at, at events like this, because it's really been uh, just about impossible until about a week ago to get any media attention on this all-important issue of, of, of election integrity. Now, what I'm going to tell you will probably uh, blow your minds, because um, if you haven't heard most of what I'm going to talk about, and the chances are you haven't, to hear it all at once can be very daunting and maybe a little discouraging, but uh, I, I want to anticipate that reaction by assuring you that this is a problem we can solve. It's a difficulty we can overcome, but we can't do that if we don't face it, we don't acknowledge it. And we haven't acknowledged it or faced it for the simple reason that the press has almost completely refused to discuss it. Rob talked about the news with air quotes around it. That's what we get in the United States. I think we have, I, I, I'm pretty confident in asserting that we have the worst news system in the world among developed countries. What we get by way of political news is, is shocking. Uh, because of its emptiness and its triviality. I want to give you some examples. Uh, I've been traveling all around the last few months, you know, as I say necessarily, because there aren't that many other ways to spread the word about what's actually been happening to the election system. So um, one of the places I went recently was Indiana, and I had a few hours to kill before my talk. Uh, and I decided to watch a little TV in my hotel room. And there was, uh, I turned on MSNBC, and, and it was uh, the, the, the build-up to the uh, Biden-Palin debate, okay, the vice presidential debate, much anticipated. Everybody's very excited about this because Sarah Palin had done such a terrible job with Katie Couric and so on. So there was a high anticipation and a lot of talk on MSNBC about how she was going to do. Did you all watch the debate? OK. Raise your hand if you did. OK, thanks. Thanks. OK, just some response. I only asked just some response, some facial tick, something. So I, I know I'm not alone in here, OK? OK, good. Um, so uh, there's MSNBC. And they announced Chris Matthews' hardballs coming up. And the announcer refers to it as the pregame. He calls Chris Matthews' show the pregame. Now, I think it's, it's, it's always a good idea to try to watch TV in general as if you've just dropped down from the moon. No, I'm serious. But by that, I mean you should try to watch it with new eyes. Try to watch it as if it's not something you're used to, but, but something um, something whose, whose oddness uh, is clear to you. And there's something extremely odd about referring to Chris Matthews' show as the pregame. So then Chris Matthews comes on, and you know, he's ye yelling, as usual. So he's yelling. And he says, he's talking about the Palin-Biden debate. He says, will she swing for the bleachers, or will she bunt and play it safe? Now, what, can anybody tell me what that means? No, seriously, what does it mean to say, to raise the question, will Sarah Palin s swing for the bleachers? How would Sarah Palin swing for the bleachers? Does that mean that she would, you know, recite one of the Federalist Papers from memory? 
Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I really want to know, does that mean that she would uh, launch into a detailed analysis of the history of the U.S. monetary system? You know, it, it doesn't really mean anything. Will she swing for the bleachers? This has nothing to do with how one might perform in a debate. What it, what it, what it does is it, it sums up, it perfectly expresses how the media covers politics. It covers politics as a spectacle that the people in the media only are equipped to judge, to assess. It is exactly like a sports, a sporting event. So when he says, will she swing for the bleachers, Chris Matthews is, is, is basically reconfirming that that's how the press, the TV press, and, and to some extent the print press too, treat politics. It's a sporting event. It's a sporting competition. And I remembered when I was watching the uh, Olympics, you know, that there was a commercial that NBC kept running, maybe some of you saw it, that intercut footage of Nastia Lukens and Michael Phelps and so on with shots of Barack Obama and John McCain, which explicitly equated politics with sports. Now, there are some serious problems with this, okay? Not least of which is the fact that the equation sets the bar very low for what constitutes a successful performance at the debate. The debate's not about answering questions uh, and then taking follow-up questions and defending a position and demonstrating knowledge and so on. It's not that at all. The debate, so-called, is simply an exchange of little performance moments, see? And what constitutes success is usually uh, not doing as bad a job as one has done in the past. I mean, this is the case with Sarah Palin. The bar is set very low because she did such a terrible job with Katie Couric. And by terrible job, what I mean is she didn't have facile answers that she could immediately give. She was halting. She was incoherent. It was not a good performance. So that if she could manage to simply utter coherent sentences and look confident and not, you know, throw up or fall down, you know, or have an accident. <laughs> Did you know what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, if there weren't some spectacular physical failure, you know, like her hair would stand on end and, and her ears would spin off her head, she did a pretty good job. You know, even if what she said was absurd or false. So the bar is set very low, and we've been around the, this block before. It was the same with the debates between Bush and Gore and the debates between Bush and Kerry, that Bush was credited with having done an okay job because he wasn't embarrassing. That's not a very promising place to start, okay? But let's step back from the question of whether the debate actually shows the candidates doing a good job and so on. Here's the really, uh, uh, here's, the, here's the most important problem with the equation of our politics with sports. If politics is sports, if it's a spectacle that we watch and that the media people judge, see, as uh, versions of Olympics judges or, you know, color commentators, see, that means that we are not a citizenry, we are an audience. It has nothing to do with self-government. It has nothing to do with whether this display will help us make up our minds about casting a vote. We're not part of the equation at all. We're not participants. We are observers. We are spectators. And we leave it to Chris and Wolf and Keith and Rachel to, to interpret it for us and do what amounts to sports casting. That's the model of this kind of commentary. So that when Chris Matthews says, will she swing for the bleachers or will she bunt and play it safe, he's doing the job that they all do which is, which is, which is sports casting. See, now I'm not saying, and this, I'm, I'm not making a statement that I'm sure you've all heard a million times, it's become a cliche and a little bit tiresome. They only talk about trivialities, they don't talk about the issues. Okay, I mean, we've heard this a thousand times, and of course it's true, of course they don't talk about the issues. What they talk about is theater, it's theatrics. It's the question of whether or not this piece of theater worked. Did it help the candidate or did it hurt? See? 